Okay, I'm um, got Michael and Ken here, um, obviously two very, very, I believe, thought-provoking presentations. I hope you've all been um, thinking, thinking up your questions. We've got about 10 minutes before I ask our um, second two speakers to join us on the stage. So does, does anyone want to go first just now? Oh, and, oh. Peter, um, have, have we got some roving microphones for this? That's great. Peter? It's more than a, more, more a, a, an observation. What I'd be really interested in, I thought it was a fantastic presentation, both, both were fantastic and complimentary, but I would be really interested in a, in a summit or, or, a, or a thought leadership uh, seminar on what you've just presented. And Elma, you and I have links with Entrepreneurial Scotland. There's some uh, money potentially to be invested uh, from the private sector in philanthropy as well. And I just wonder whether the concept that you've just taken us through today, which is hugely interesting, is something that we could uh, take further and actually have a concentrated session on this. Other kind of observation would be commissioning. We're, we've got a realigning children's services board for Scotland. I sit on that. This would really play well with a big system change programme for Scotland and uh, I think it should be uh, taken further. I'm really fascinated. So no question, but really affirmative uh, commentary from you on what I've just heard. Thank you. If I could just say on that, Peter, that absolutely delighted and I think it is a real need within Scotland. Um, I think one of the things that uh, strikes me as I look around the landscape is that we have a lack of innovation within the financial and the actual structure we're very good at service innovation. We're very good at coming forward with really clever ideas about how to do things better, particularly in the delivery of services. But I would say that one of the things we are weak on is that financial innovation and the bit that will enable the services to be delivered. Okay, thank, thanks for that, Kenneth. Um, I, I think um, we can probably take that, that thought um, sort of offline and see whether we can make something like that work, Peter. Um, are there, are anyone else um, ready to, to, to ask, your, ask your question now? We heard some really, really fascinating um, stuff this morning. Um, you know, Michael was telling us about where he thinks the shift is going to take place. I'm quite sure a number of you have got thoughts on that. Nope, nope. Well, while, while you're thinking about that, because um, you never know, one, one thing I do in North Ayrshire, which most of you in this audience will not know about, is that when I have a mic in my hand, sometimes I go on a rove with that microphone. So I'll just leave that thought with you while you think about your questions. Um, but I'll, I'll ask one, um, Michael. I was struck when you were talking about the shift towards um, thinking more about how we work with 16 to 24 year olds. And um, I'm also very conscious that those 16 to 24 year olds will, in many cases, be parents themselves with very young children, which adds a degree of complexity, I think, to, to you know, how, how you're working with those, those young people. And I just wondered if you could say a few, a few more words on your thoughts around how, how that might look and feel from, um, I guess, a, a local authority perspective and working with those, those people. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, we, we actually have a little study going now with um, some colleagues in the United States who are interested in replicating the work we did in the book, Bringing Everything I Am Into One Place in the United States. Uh, and that book was driven by young people who were facing severe and multiple disadvantages. They led the inquiry that we were undertaking. But in the United States, what they want to do is to focus on a population that are in what they call child welfare and who are also parents themselves. Uh, and it's a really uh, understudied area uh, and one that would make, you know, I think quite a lot of difference to our, our knowledge base. Of course, the other aspect of that is the thing that gets forgotten in all of that is the fathers of the children that are being born to the children in the care system and so forth. You know, and that's never part of the equation um, that we, we think about. And the other aspect I would say about it is, of course, when we think of prevention and early intervention, we get locked into this early years part of it. But prevention and early intervention with 16-year-olds who may or do become parents is prevention and early intervention. So I think there is a lot of um, opportunity for development there. And just one more thing, again, reflecting on the care system, 
you know, if this is happening in the care system, what does it tell us about the care system? I don't think it necessarily says the care system isn't working, but it is, again, a reminder of the need to reflect on what the care system is doing well and what it's doing badly. Okay, so can we can we have a, a show of hands? Yes, we have someone over here. Could you could you just tell us who you are, please? Uh, yes, thank you. I'm Kay Fowley, the Child Health Commissioner from NHS Tayside, and I was particularly interested in the model that you put up, Kenneth. But I'm thinking, what happens um, at the end of the investment period if the savings that you initially had identified don't materialise? Good question. Um, what happens is that the responsibility for borrowing is aligned with the responsibility for repayment. And it's basically, it's, we see this model, uh, we like it because it aligns that together. So the local authority, if it's taking on that borrowing, it is taking on the responsibility to find and repay that money. And therefore, it, the onus falls on the local authority. And it's about, and this is one of the things that when we had discussions with civil servants about this, they were quite unhappy at times about this. And I had some of the questions about why can we not put more risk onto the charities? And I think, yes, but what you're doing is you're comparing, as I mentioned before, effectively an elephant and a flea. And I said, you cannot put all the risk, as it currently often is, onto the charities you have to look and align with the resources that are available. So what, what it is, is it's a, in a sense a grown-up world where if the local authority wants to borrow the money, then it has to take that responsibility of repaying it and finding the savings. And of course the other thing I'd say is it makes it much easier for the local authority because a lot of these early intervention preventative type services are across budgets and therefore, it's much easier for someone like the local authority to be able to work across that and to be able to via across budgets than it is for, for example, a, a charity to be able to try and get within one budget head. Okay, thanks, thanks, Kenneth. Um, do we have some got another hand here? Um, are, are there others who want to ask questions? And we'll get someone up the back after that. Okay. Take this question first, then. then. Hi, my name is Joe Cocker. I'm the Improvement Manager in Dumfries and Galloway Council. Michael, I was absolutely fascinated by what you were saying. It seemed to me that what you were saying is children don't need services in their lives. They need role models, people, communities, and people to love them. But that's an enormous leap of faith to move from a, a belief in services to deliver everything to a belief in communities delivering anything. Have you seen any um, developments that have allowed that leap of faith to take place effectively? <coughs> Yeah, and I, I just want to stress again, this, this, the, the book I mentioned earlier on, it was very difficult to get people to think plural. You know, we, like, we, we love in, in, in the UK, I think Scotland's the same in this respect, we love one thing, one idea to trump another idea. So the idea that communities are important doesn't trump the idea that we can also help um, individuals. But, for example, if you take the evidence on collective efficacy, that's right up there in the sort of evidence-based realm. You know, there are lots of examples of interventions that have really made a difference. But also, there are a lot of examples of interventions that haven't made a difference. So, for example, um, there's, a, there's a program, I'm gonna blank on the name now, in the United States, where they gave people in New York City the opportunity to move house to any neighborhood they wanted to go to, to break out of this cycle of poverty that's about community development in its own kind of way. It was an absolute disaster. As soon as people got out of communities that they felt they were disadvantaging them, they found they were more disadvantaged because they were isolated. And I suppose that's the, the, the difference. I mean, I was thinking, you know, this morning when I was thinking about what I was gonna say, some of what I'm saying is what we were saying in the 1960s. But I don't think it's the same. I think it's about trying to make these transitions in a smart way and in an evidence-based way. And there are some things that we do when we try to engage with civil society that is effective, and there are some things that we do um, that, 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 that is ineffective. Sorry, my brain doesn't work quite as quickly as Michael's. And there's another point I just wanted to come back on about risk, and I think it's worth making. And that is that the model uh, one of the great advantages of it is that there's the trial period. 
So if you can't identify, if a local authority can't identify the savings during that trial period, then there is the termination point, so they're not bound into something that goes on and on, and obviously having to repay very large amounts of money. I'm sorry. Thanks, Thanks Kenneth. Um, we had a question right, right up at the back here. Thank you. I'm Stephen McLeod from NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. And one comment for Kenneth, and I think that the, the opportunity to lever in some money to facilitate change, I think, is probably the most difficult thing that the public sector find to do. Um, sit, when I look at the services that I'm responsible for, 85% of those costs are in staffing. And the, the staffing change within the NHS is very difficult to, to engineer. But a question for Michael. You mentioned the changes in New York, and we were very lucky recently to have Dr Sylvia Rowlands visit us and spend a few days with us talking about her experiences. Um, and the figure of 55,000 children in substitute care being brought down to 12,000 was mentioned. Could you say something about um, your understanding of what colleagues did in New York? And the criticism of that not being transferable to the UK is, is commonly raised. Do you have any views about that? Uh, well, I mean, I, I definitely you know, have views on... I, I think there's absolutely no reason why that can't be replicated anywhere in the UK. Um, I mean, the way in which we've gone about that work has essentially been about managing what we call system dynamics. So what happens is if I look at the data for Scotland, in fact, Kate's sitting behind you, she can provide this data because I asked, it, asked her for it you know, a few months ago. In Scotland, there are 20, how many local authorities? 32 local authorities. If I look, if I do one thing, I, if I put on one axis, I ask Kate to put the levels of maternal deprivation or some other indicator of need down the bottom. And on the other axis, I want the rate of children in local authority care. That, that, that line, it, about 32% of the variation is explained by maternal deprivation or need. So something like 60-odd percent is being explained by the decisions that people in this room are taking. So when we work with local authorities to bring the number down, we do four things. We say, first of all, choose a number. So don't pretend that the number's being driven by lots of external things that you can't control. You're choosing the number now, so choose the number that you want to have. That's our item one. Item two, it's then about managing the dynamics. So we have uh, methods for increasing the outflow of children. There are always children in care who are ready to go home. We can identify those children and get them home more quickly. Secondly, we then get people to think differently about length of stay. It's a rather weird thing about children in care. You come into care for six weeks or six months, and we get people to say, I, I would like this, the social worker say, I'd like this child to be looked after for 13 days. At the end of the 13 days, if they need more time, the social worker comes back. But that one variable alone reduces the, the amount of number, the, the, the number of children in care at any one time. And then finally, we look at the inflow, trying to do things differently so children don't have to come into the care system. Um, and then finally, the one bit that we have, we didn't do in New York, and we want to do with the five English local authorities, I would really like to see it replicated here in Scotland, is we then find out whether those children are better off or not. In New York, the number came down from 50,000 to 32,000. It went down to 18,000 because the dynamic was pushing it down, and it plateaued there from 2004 to 2016. Nobody's, there have been no scandals in New York, um, there have been no great crises in, 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 the, in the children's system, but we don't know in the end whether the children who didn't come into care are better off or worse off, and that's the thing that we really, we really need to find out. Thank you, Thank you Michael. Um, are there any final questions before we, we bring this part of our, our, our uh, session to a close? No. No. Okay, well, can, can I please ask you to join me again in thanking both Michael Little and Kenneth Ferguson for two excellent and thought-provoking presentations to add to our thinking on transforming children's services today. Thank you both, gentlemen.